Okay, well, greetings everyone. Welcome, hello to everyone in person and to those who are watching online. We're so glad that you're with us today as we are here now on this Sunday morning to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I'm, uh, wherever you might be today, I'm glad that you are with us. As we start our worship today, I wanted to begin by meditating upon Scripture, by hearing the words of Jesus for us. And so uh, if you have your Bible today, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. And our reading is going to be from verses 25 through 30. Matthew 11, 25 to 30. Uh, if you were a part of our gentle and lowly Bible study from last fall, this text will be familiar to you. Uh, but I also thought it would be apt for us today. So if you would listen, for this is God's word to us. Matthew 11, verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yet, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would, please bow your heads with me and let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we gather today before your throne, as we gather to worship you and your son, Jesus Christ, uh, we are coming to him as those who need refuge, as those who uh, need the rest that we can only receive in Christ Jesus. And indeed, because of his uh, becoming a human like us, because of his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Uh, Father, we know that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ also can have eternal life. We can know forgiveness. And so, Father, we begin today just by confessing our sins. And we do so because your word tells us that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we um, desire to grow closer to you this hour. And so, Father, we pray that as we sing songs, as we read from your word, as we hear it proclaimed, as we give of our tithes and of our offerings, uh, Father, we pray that you would be glorified. Would you help us now to put aside our concerns? Would you help us to put aside our anxieties, our worries, our stressors? And, Father, would you help us to focus upon you today? Because that's what we need more than anything else. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here with us today. And also a special welcome to everyone joining us online. We're so thankful that you're here with us, worshiping together even in a different room this morning. Uh, but as Ryan said uh, this morning, it's so good to have more of a normal Sunday where we're all back together. We don't have any concerns over weather today or any of that stuff. And uh, I'm just so excited to worship with you today. So let's stand and sing together. We're going to start with a song called Only King Forever. So let's stand and sing. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. 
forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign. And every knee will bow.
chorus together. seated. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of James in the New Testament, the book of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 18. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 18. Would you listen for this is God's word. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man. Unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower fails and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has given birth, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is yet fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we turn now to this time of intercessory prayer in the church, where we pray for the needs in our church body and also in the community, I wanted us to meditate upon this word, right? To have this truth from James first, knowing that we should pray in faith without doubting, confident that the Lord will be faithful to give us what we need. Second, that we realize that every gift that he does give comes from, every gift that we have comes from God. And so therefore, uh, we have all the more occasion to go to him continually in prayer. Well, uh, as we pray for the needs in the body, I want to just put a couple of things on your radar. One uh, is that, um, one just kind of request for this hour even, is uh, many of you an hour ago saw McKenna Moore here with us. She was in our business meeting. Well, she uh, started not feeling well just a little bit bit ago. Um, You might say, well, does she have COVID? She, She had COVID actually two weeks ago. So that's, she's on the other side of that. So we don't need to worry about can, you know, exposure, but we do want to pray for her. She wasn't feeling very strong today. Also, we want to pray for, uh, I want to say a prayer today for our homebound members and just to have a couple people in particular in mind, so you'll hear us mention them in our prayer today. And of course, we want to pray for just our city, pray for our nation as COVID continues to spread and make people sick. Right now, um, even uh, most of Samantha's family has it, and I know that's probably true for some of you. You've got different pockets in your life of people you know who uh, have contracted COVID, so we want to pray for them and their well-being too. So if you would, let's bow our heads together now, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now knowing that we do need your mercy, your kindness, your compassion. 
Father, we uh, need this ourselves, but we want to pray especially today for those who are sick, for those who, uh, whether they have a long-term illness or a short-term illness, for those who might have COVID or any, any, any other condition which is making them ill today, we ask that you would give them strength. Today we want to pray for McKenna, even this hour, that you would give her strength, Father, that you would help her to feel better and um, to feel more like herself. Father, we also want to pray today for those in our church who are homebound. Uh, I have in mind a few people today. We want to pray for our brother Jim Williamson. We're thankful for his service here through the years and just pray that you would strengthen Jim, that you would encourage him. We want to pray for our sister Helen Cook and, and for her daughter Susan um, as, we, as they are at, um, in Hendersonville now. We pray that you would uh, give them comfort and encouragement, Father. Give them fellowship with the people who they live near. And um, would you uh, be with them? We also pray for uh, our brother and sister, George and Jane Thompson, uh, who have been such faithful members here. And if they would be here right now, they, if they could be here, they would. Uh, and we're thankful that they join us remotely on Wednesdays. But Father, we we'd still pray for their health. We pray that you would give George in particular good days, Father, with, um, with his health, and I pray you would strengthen Jane and be with her family as they help care for them these days. Father, we want to pray for, um, Father, all those who uh, are in need or have want today, especially as we experience such great cold uh, over the last few days, and we know that there are people who live in our city who uh, don't have an address to call home. They don't have a place where they can lay their head at night. And so we want to continue to pray for those uh, who are homeless and ask that you would give them shelter. We're thankful for ministries like the Rescue Mission and Room in the Inn. And we pray that you would uh, expand such ministries so that everyone who needs a place can find a place. And we also pray for even the larger um, causes uh, that are out there that cause homelessness, that you would uh, help even those root conditions to be addressed and solved so that uh, our community can flourish, that every person who lives here can flourish, Father. Um, God, we pray for our, uh, our community today and just ask that you would help us, Father, as we endeavor to engage them with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the good news of the salvation that he offers. Father, would you help us to uh, joyfully bear this message upon our lips, that because of Jesus Christ, your Son, not only do we exist, but in him we are redeemed because of his death upon the cross and because of his resurrection from the grave. And so, Father, I pray that this would not just be something that uh, is our identity as Christians, although it is that and it ought to be that, but rather that this would motivate us in our every day, that we would not... Uh, day, not an hour would pass without us considering the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection for our lives, not just for our future, but even in the present. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts. Father, would you grow our affection for you? Help us to not love the things of the world, but rather that we would love you, your son Jesus Christ, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit as we endeavor to live lives of faith and holiness. Father, we do want to pray for our government leaders today. We pray for President Joe Biden, Governor Bill Lee, Mayor John Cooper. We pray for these men and all other men and women who serve at any level of the government, asking that you would give them wisdom. Help them to do uh, in, in their actions and in their decisions that they would choose for justice and righteousness, not simply uh, and not ever solely in the interest of their party but rather for the interest of all peoples. Um, Father, we pray that you would break the partisan gridlock so that uh, we can act for the good of all of our citizens. But again, we just pray you'd give wisdom uh, to those who serve in the government. But Father, as we continue now in our time of worship, we pray that you would continue to draw our hearts towards you and would you come near to us. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, as Ryan said just a minute ago in his prayer, um, you know, we need God's kindness, we need his mercy, and, um, you know, it's easy for us to think, well, those people we prayed for really need God, but each and every one of us does too, and so I want us to stand and sing this next song together as we declare that, Lord, I need you. So let's stand and sing this together, if you would stand with me.
sing with me. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. God, how I need you. Your sin runs deep, your grace is more, your grace is found, is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness. Is Christ in me, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand I'll fall on you sing it out Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture reading today is going to come from the book of Psalms, chapter 46. Psalm 46. If you would listen, for this is God's Word to us. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in her midst, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. 
The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May you be seated and let us pray. Father, we need you. So would you speak for your servants are listening. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Amen. Today I would like us all to consider the question, what do you do when you are distressed? What do you do when you are distressed? There are times in our life where chaos seems to envelop us. You receive a phone call that alters your life for the worse. Or you sit in the cold hospital room in a gown, leaving you half exposed. And the doctor comes in to tell you news of a life-altering diagnosis. Or you open that piece of mail, knowing it's a bill for that recent hospital stay. But whenever you see the number attached to that bill, you almost fall over for how much it is. Or you try and you try and you try to get through life. And it seems like at every step there is something or someone determined to impede your progress. There's never a hand up, always a hand down. And something, and and you struggle, right? Something or someone upon which your entire life depended is suddenly gone. Well, for many people listening today, these scenarios aren't fiction. They're things that you or someone you know and love has experienced that have caused you to face uncertainty and a new, more difficult future. Psalm 46, the scripture that I'm preaching on today, is one that I believe will be significant for us. I think it's significant for each person. I think it's significant for us as a people, as a congregation, in this time, in this moment. I think it's a word that we need to hear, that to internalize, to memorize, to bury, take this truth and to bury it deep in our heart, in the very core of our being. This truth, namely that God is our refuge. God is our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. It's a truth that becomes more important the longer that we live Not because it was ever less important, but the longer we live, the more that we suffer, the more that we experience and experience the inevitable weakness that will come with us as we age. That maturing, although it does come with greater joys, greater ability, greater opportunity, it also comes with great sorrow. In every moment of our lives, we need to realize that we are dependent upon the Lord. We sing the song that we sang just a moment ago, I need thee, oh I need thee, and it's him, I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. We sing that, and we mean it at first, but we might only realize that maybe once a year. But as life picks up, you realize that maybe once a month, eventually every day, and then Soon, every hour, we realize that we truly are dependent upon the Lord to be our refuge and that we are in need of God. And our entire lives should be based upon this truth. It's not simply what Bobby McFerrin said in that 1988 hit, don't worry, be happy. It's more than that. It's an honest assessment of the trials that befall us and the anxiety that they bring, but an even more clear-eyed conviction that God is true to his word. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of David, the God of Hagar and Huldah, of Isaiah and Jeremiah, of Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth, Zechariah, Peter, Paul, Priscilla and Aquila, James and John. This God is for us and not against us. Whenever we hear a sermon like we are doing right now, we 
sit beneath God's word in order to not only learn more about him, but that we might know him and his son, Jesus Christ, and his Holy Spirit, whom he has sent to us. And so today, as we consider Psalm 46, here's what I hope you'll experience. That God is unchanging, ever-present, and always faithful. And though our circumstances may be distressing, Jesus beckons us to rest in him. Let me say that one more time. God is unchanging, ever-present, and always faithful. And though our circumstances may be distressing, Jesus beckons us to rest in him. Well, the first thing that we see in this psalm is that the psalmist wants us to know that God's protection leads us from fear to faith. God's protection leads us from fear to faith. Now, there are times and experiences, I mentioned this a moment ago, we experience things in our life and it might lead us to this conclusion that God is faithful. Right? And again, a, a lifetime of faithfulness, that slow uh, trust that is, Eugene Peterson called it, a long obedience in the same direction that we experience as Christians in our life in Christ, it teaches us that we can trust him. He is the God of all seasons. Right? And we see in the Bible, Abraham learns this. Right? He receives a promise from God and it really takes him into his later adult years to really internalize what that promise means for him and to really trust what God said in his word whenever he promised him a descendant. But the psalmist doesn't simply, um, he would agree that we can grow in that truth, that we learn it, but where the way that he begins today is by stating it. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. That is the truth that we believe, and therefore, what are the implications for our life? How do we live that out in faith? God is our bulwark, our banner. This is the mantra of the psalmist. He is, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's our shelter and our safety to whom we go for rest and repose. And even whenever we don't think we can go on any longer, he is our strength. Right, everything else that the psalmist says after this, it proceeds from that affirmation. It's the same truth, this psalm, is what led Martin Luther to write to him, a mighty fortress is our God. Right, it takes guts to be a Christian. And here's the thing, if you follow Jesus Christ, you inevitably will receive opposition or criticism from somewhere. Sometimes that comes from the world. They see your faith in Jesus, in particular if you believe that Jesus is the only way for salvation, that all of God's word is inspired. Sometimes following that makes people upset. But sometimes that criticism can even come from within the church. I, I, I know stories of friends and I have read accounts of people. They read their Bibles and they're trying to live faithfully and they realize, you know what? I've, my faith, our faith together hasn't been up to snuff with what God's word calls upon us. And so they decide to step out in obedience and faith and whenever they utter their words, they get pushed back by people who are fellow Christians, right? Their, fear, their fiercest critics are from within the church because they've upset the status quo. They didn't just let things go on as they were. But whenever you call the world to account on behalf of injustice, whenever you call the world to faith in Jesus Christ, there will be opposition, but we can do these things knowing that Jesus, that God himself, is our refuge. We don't need to fear. I think of Charles T. Carter, who was pastoring in Chilton County, Alabama in 1956. Dr. Carter, uh, as a young minister, he was 19 years old. He was excited to be pastoring a church and was excited to be a faithful Christian in all areas. And one day he had a local black minister come and preach or, or just pray at the end of a meeting to his, with his predominantly white congregation, doing a thing that is normal, shouldn't be considered odd at all. Well, two weeks later, there was a countywide youth rally, and the youth were there. It was open to youth of all ages, all races, and they were gathering and during the rally, 10 hooded members of the Ku Klux Klan marched to the front of the stage. They prayed a white supremacist prayer, threw $10 in the, in the offering plate, and they walked out of the room. Whenever that happens, what do you do? 
a veiled or maybe not so veiled threat has been made. You could keep going or you could stop. But Dr. Carter kept going because he knew that God was his refuge. Even the next day he got on the countywide radio station, he explained what happened and he denounced it as anti-Christ and against God, as a blasphemous act. And because of that, he received death threats, but he carried on. He went on to have a successful ministry in Birmingham, Alabama, and continues to minister to this day. You can't do something like that if you don't think that God is your refuge. Or to say it another way, you can only do something like that if you're convinced that God is your refuge. That he is your strength to, get you, to help you through each trial. The translations say that he is a very present help. And, and it's interesting because in the Hebrew, it's actually said he is a greatly found help. That is, he will be found if we need him on the day of distress. He is there with us. And the implication, that's the truth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then he fleshes that out in verse 2. He gives some examples. Verse 2, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains fall and be moved, or a better translation might be that the mountains topple into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains tremble at its swelling. Let me translate this one step further. If the world is falling apart... There's chaos all around. We will not fear. And again, the movement is from fear to faith. Now, of course, these are not always in total opposition to one another. The Bible has plenty of accounts of people who had right reason to fear, but even in the midst of the fear, they were led to believe, to trust. But I think that part of faith is trusting in the midst of fear that God's got you. He will hold you, and you can count on that. We remember the word in 1 John chapter 4 that God's perfect love casts out all fear. But we live in greater confidence. And then in your Bible you might see this. I think it's on the screen on verse 3 at the very end. We see this word selah. And you probably wonder, well, why is that there? It's a little word and it doesn't happen in every psalm, but it happens at different points. And to, to be clear and to be fair... There's a lot of dispute as to what this means. No one really knows. But my pastor growing up said it this way, and I think it's helpful. That when we see that in the Psalms, it should, we should maybe read it as something that is, think about that. So you read the first three verses of Psalm 46, and you see that phrase, and it says, think about that. Slow down. Meditate upon it. Chew on that for a while. Absorb that. And let your mind wander with that in, uh, with that in, in thought. Think about this truth. And I want to give you a thought, not to build to. We could get here at the end of the sermon, but I want us to start here today. Based upon this verse, based upon this psalm in verse 1. Whenever it says God is our refuge and strength, the actual ordering of the text in Hebrew goes this way. God is for us a refuge and strength. And that reminded me of another text that expounds this very well in Romans chapter 8. We've, I've preached on this before. We've read it together. One of the most uh, resounding passages in all of the Bible. Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. I want to read it for you now. What, sh what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall, be, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. And so we can trust God knowing that his protection leads us from fear to faith. But we also see in this psalm that God's presence preserves us. God's presence preserves us. Look at verses 4 and 5. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. 
God is in the midst of her. She shall never be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The answer is to know Emmanuel. To know Emmanuel. That God is with us. I want you to think about the setting of the psalmist. Whoever it was in ancient Israel, the holy habitation of God was known as Mount Zion, namely the city of Jerusalem, where the temple was, where God met with his people. And it helps to know a little bit about the geography of Jerusalem as we get into this, right? We don't all need to become biblical archaeologists. That's not, but this, it's helpful to know that Zion, Jerusalem, is on a mountain, not a very tall mountain, but a mountain that's surrounded by valleys on three sides. And so that was important because if it was ever to be attacked, well, you had to go uphill to get there. But a second feature of Jerusalem that makes it suitable for a city in the ancient Near East is that there's a spring that runs right beside it, the Gihon Spring. And so if you look at ancient maps of Jerusalem, uh, there's a walled city, and then there's a little tiny wall that cuts out right from the side of it that covers that spring up. It allowed them to have water, a dependable source of life in the midst of a, a world where the seasons change and they don't have plumbing to get water anywhere it might need to go. Helps them whenever there's a siege against them to not dry up in two or three days, but rather they have a source of life. And so verse five, I think is significant, or verse four, I mean, is significant. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The fact that God has given the city a source of life that will allow it to endure even whenever the hardships come, right? And that water was a sense that it had God's protection and provision, right? But what is more significant than the water? It's the source of living water himself, namely God, the Most High, as the psalm calls him. And I want us to think about it for just a second, because the Most High God, he doesn't really need a place to dwell, right? He created the universe. He created all the earth. He's not bound by any space, but rather he chooses a place to call his own. And so if there is a holy habitation, it's because he has decided to make that his habitation, but even more so, again, we are trusting that God is with us. Emmanuel, he has come to us, to all people in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And now he is not bound, irrespective of location, God is with us. Jesus is at the right hand of God in heaven. And so we can say along with Psalm 24 that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. Wherever God's people call upon his name, there God is. It says that God is in her midst. And this means that the city has protection, even though there's chaos turning in the world. All right, it's not unlikely that this psalm was written during a siege of Jerusalem, whenever enemies were coming to attack the city. And look at verses, uh, in the language in verses 6 and 7. Where it says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. Uh, it says that God is with the city when morning dawns. I think of an ancient battle where uh, you're fighting at night. You don't know the size of the hordes that are on the other side of the wall. There aren't electric floodlights that you can use to see the enemy. But as the dawn comes, you see the help that is there. You receive help from the Lord. You have help on the way. The God who has the very power to form and deform creation by his word is on your side. And it calls, the title it uses of God is the Lord of hosts is with us. God, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies who commands legions of angels on our behalf, who is Jacob's fortress. And I want us to think about the opposition that you and I might encounter today. And I want us to take our cue from Ephesians chapter 6 from the Apostle Paul. He says in chapter 6 verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, we live in a society where we really don't have many threats. I mean, in the three years that I've been here and in all 30 years of my life, I've never encountered someone who has physically tried to stop me from practicing my faith. Uh, and so we might say, well, we live in a society where, you know, there's no physical struggle. It's just a spiritual struggle. And I would say, Paul didn't mean that when he wrote this, because Paul encountered plenty of physical struggles. Okay, he was beaten for the faith. He was cast out of cities. He was thrown into prison. He was shipwrecked multiple times. 
in the, face, in the service of the Lord. But even in the midst of the physical challenges that he faced, so whether the physical challenges are present or are not, he still said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but our enemies are the spiritual powers. And so that's true for us today. And so we understand that God is the one who guards us, and we need to go to God and use his means for our defense. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13, because Paul's answer is then, we need to take up the armor of God. Let's read this together. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on you the belt of truth, put, having, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now we could go through each piece of equipment there, and there are many, we've done that before on Wednesday nights. We, there are many studies that have done that. But I want us to actually focus on that last verse again. How is it that Paul recommends that Christians apply the armor of God in their life? By prayer. Praying, to no, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. The way in which we apply the armor of God, the way in which we apply to God for defense is by prayer. And thus, we need to go to God in all circumstances, all circumstances trusting that he has the ability to sustain us and to give us stability even in the midst of chaos. And moreover, that he will give himself to us and give us rest. So we saw that God's protection leads us from fear to faith. We've seen that God's presence preserves us. And finally, I want us to see in Psalm 46 that God's peace ends our burdens. God's peace ends our burdens. God is our refuge, but indeed he avails himself not just to us, but to all of his creation. Our restoration that we have as Christians, the new life that we experience in Christ, it's but just one piece of the restoration that God is at work in in the world today, in a world that is broken and haunted by sin. And whenever we witness an individual instance of God's protection in our lives, it's a glimpse of what will, what will come for us everywhere someday. Verse 8 is an invitation to us based upon this truth. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. And that might not seem good. He's our refuge, but he brings desolation. What kind? Look at verse 9. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bows and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Simply put, God is the destroyer of the destroyers. Who work to break what he has created and to deform what he has formed. Remember, in the Bible, we look forward to this day that the Bible says we will turn our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. I like to translate that today. We turn our tanks into tractors and our guns into garden tools. Right? If you read Revelation chapter 22, the Bible ends where it begins, namely in a garden that God is working to restore. So brothers and sisters, hear me when I say this, that God will establish peace. God will establish peace. He will do away with evil so that good may prosper. He will put away wickedness so that righteousness will flourish. And as a result of God's reign of peace, there will be rest that can be found to all who have faith in him. And this is the fruit and really the goal of our faith, to enter into the rest that God is preparing for us. For us to live in a way that's not anxious, but rather that trust in him and to be still. Look at verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Even though the world seems like it's swirling all around us, everything's going to pot. Our hopes, our dreams are coming to an end. Troubles come that we didn't even know were a possibility. We still, before God, need to be still. Or in the Hebrew, we might translate that to relax. It literally means to sink, fall back, rest in the arms of the Father. And it's a word to us who live in constant anxiety. I don't know if you've experienced anxiety before. I have. I know it's not fun. 
And I know some of you have experienced anxiety to far greater degrees than I have. We're called to rest in God, to rest in the peace that he brings. Jesus Christ, who took on our flesh and lived as a human and still is a human, Jesus Christ is the only person who is always on time, never anxious, and ever present. He had the weight of the world on his shoulders and he bore our sins upon that tree 2,000 years ago. He lived among people who had the same burdens that you have and I have, different time, different place, but the same burdens, the same cares. And he had many of those burdens himself. He knows. And remember what we read earlier as we opened up the worship service uh, with Matthew chapter 11. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and what? And I will give you rest. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. We're looking forward to that rest, and it's, it's, it's one that the Bible points us forward to. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is very explicit about this. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11 says this. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered into God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall from the same sort of disobedience. He goes on to say today, as, yes, as long as it is called today, repent of your sins and rest in God. Know, as we sometimes sing here, that God works for our good and for his glory. Uh, there's a song that is called Sovereign Over Us that I've enjoyed in, in recent years. And in the bridge of that song, it says, Even when the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good and for your glory. We remember that even in the midst of turbulent times, what Isaiah the prophet said, that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord remains forever. I've been thinking about Psalm 46 for a while now. I've been thinking of something that I need to meditate upon in our life. And again, as I said earlier, I think we as a congregation really need to internalize this this year. And I think that it would be instructive for us to try to memorize this psalm. It's one psalm, 11 verses. You probably know eight out of the 11 verses, you know, at least in some translation. If you were to, you know, if I was to poke you, you could probably say one of the lines yourself. But I really do think that as we memorize it, as God's word is engraved upon our heart, as we hide it in our heart, it will shape us. It will shape how we live. So don't be surprised this year if you hear me reading it a lot on Sunday mornings. If this is our opening call to worship or if this is our scripture reading because we, I think we need to hear this message. Listen, brothers and sisters, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountain be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. It shall never be moved. The nations rage, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease for the, uh, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Brothers and sisters, may it be so among us. May it be so. If you would, please bow your heads with me. And let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we all do carry burdens, different burdens. Some of our burdens are related to our physical health and well-being, or some of them are 
concerning the health of our loved ones, our family members. Father, sometimes we have a relationship or a series of relationships that are strained, that are falling apart. Father, there are people we know and love who are hurting, and maybe they even hurt themselves. We bring them to you now. Father, we, there might be people here today who are seeking you for provision. Right, as we consider the needs in our life, and well, you know the needs better than any one of us do. Father, there might be people here who even live in anxiety, maybe due to real things that are rightly giving them burdens, and maybe there's just an anxiety that they can't seem to get out from underneath that's crushing them. Maybe that anxiety is even caused because of conviction of sin. Father, you are the one who can lift all of our burdens. You are the fortress to whom we can run for refuge. And so, Father... I pray that this would be true of every person in the room today. I pray that it would be true in my life and in all of our lives, that we would trust you, Father, that our faith would be strengthened as we go through trials because we are experiencing what your word has already promised, namely that you are a present help in the time of trouble. If we call upon you, we certainly will find you because you are for us and not against us. And we chiefly know this because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to earth to become like us, to bear our sins upon the cross in order that we might be given new life, an eternal life, that we might experience the resurrection that Jesus Christ himself experienced. So, Father, would you go with us now? Go before us. I I pray if there's anyone today who hasn't professed faith in Jesus Christ or who needs to return to you, that they would do so. Father, not for the sake of anyone else, but for their their own sake, that they would come, that they would know, that they would trust and believe. I pray that you would strengthen our faith, Father. Would you keep us and bring us to yourself and give us the rest that you promised. (coughs) Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. As we reflect on Ryan's message this morning and think about God being our refuge and strength, I want you to stand and sing this song with me called Always. Let's sing together. My foes are many, they rise against me. But I will hold my ground I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm My help is on the way My help is on the way Oh my God He will not delay My refuge and strength Always I will not fear, His promise is true, my God will come through, always, always. Trouble surrounds me, chaos abounding, my soul will rest in I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way, oh my God, he will not delay, my refuge and strength always, I will not fear his promises. My God will come through always, always. I lift my eyes up, my help.
love comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Oh, my God, he will not delay my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, his promise is true. My God will come through always. My refuge and strength always, always. You'd be seated. Again, I want to just thank everyone for being here today, um, for entering into the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ with us today. Uh, as we leave, I have just a couple of announcements I want to share with you. First, I want to just say, if, if you are a visitor today, we have in the, in the pew in front of you, in the pew back, we have some visitor cards. We would be delighted if you would fill that out and leave a copy with us. You can hand it to me on the way out or um, leave it in an offering plate. We, we will collect it. Um, but help us to stay in touch with you and to share more, uh, get to know you better. You can get to know us a little bit better that way. Uh, but also a couple other just weekly announcements today. We uh, have our weekly uh, prayer meeting and Bible study this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And so, uh, let me see, what's first? Is that first? What's the, okay, yeah, that's 6 o'clock. Uh, that'll be in the fellowship hall. You can also join online. If you grab a copy of the Table Talk, uh, which is our weekly prayer list and has announcements on it, you can find the information yeah, you can find the information on there. Uh, if, you, if you're not able to be there in person, how you can join remotely over a conference call or over the internet. We are continuing our study on intercessory prayer through the Old Testament. And so this week we're going to be looking at the uh, figure of Samuel in the Bible. Samuel, so uh, feel free to read the opening uh, chapters of 1 Samuel there and we will uh, see how that contributes to our understanding of intercessory prayer. Uh, but also our youth group, um, we, Lord willing, will be meeting this Wednesday in person over in the Christian Life Center. So if you have any students in your family or uh, if you know of students who might be interested in attending, they'll meet at 6, six o'clock in person over there. Also wanted to uh, share something with you all. We are Next week, I'm going to be starting a new sermon series on the book of Philippians. And so uh, excited about this series. It, it will carry us to Easter and as one thing to, we're going to do as a part of that, we we're making available to you, uh, we have uh, purchased copies of these scripture journals, Philippians scripture journals. And what they are, um, it's the, you know, the Bible is, you know, I've got one bound volume here, uh, roughly, let's see, uh, almost 2,000 pages, but really it's a collection of 66 books. And so whenever we preach through a book together, we're preaching on one of those 66 books. And so as we go through Philippians, we have these scripture journals. What they are is it has the text kind of in a large font and then some uh, space on the other page where you can take notes. It could be a great thing to just aid your study as you study Philippians yourself, as we maybe take notes as I'm preaching through uh, this book. Um, also, it could be a great way to invite someone to come to church. Um, hey, we're, studying, we're starting a study of Philippians right now. I actually have a copy of the book I'd love to give you. Uh, you can read ahead and, and join us. So, We've got copies over here on the side and in the back. Um, if you need one, take one. We're asking for a suggested donation of $5, but of course, if you don't have that with you today or if you can't afford that, that's okay. We'd rather you take one and have it for your own edification or again, to give to someone else for their edification uh, than uh, to recoup that. So I uh, wanted to let you know about that. I'm really excited about having this resource available uh, to us just as we focus on this book and as we meditate upon it together over the next several months. Um, and then in addition to that, wanted to let you know, just again, remind you how you can give, especially if you're joining us online. Uh, we'll have the basket here down front at the end of the service. You can bring it, uh, your, your 
gifts, your tithes and your offerings to that. But also you can give online at dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash give. Um, if you can't give online, you could bring it by the church office here during the week, or you can give us a call. We'd be glad to have someone uh, arrange to have a, pick that up or figure out a way to get that uh, down here if you want to give in that way. Uh, that's all. Uh, as the service ends, I'm going to be back in the lobby. I'd love to say hi to you on the way out today, but Jonathan and Lindsay are going to come and lead us in one final song. But before they do so, uh, let's bow our heads and, and pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the truth that you are dependable, that you are for us and that you are not against us, that we can de- trust on you always. Father, I pray that as we go forward from this place today that you would, um, Father, encourage us, help us to uh, be well. Um, I pray that everyone who goes out would uh, be able to return again, Father, and would you help us as we interact with our neighbors and our family and our co-workers this week that we would be the salt and light uh, that Jesus calls us to be, um, that we would uh, love our neighbor as ourself, but most of all that we would love you, Father, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been great to worship with all of you this morning. Uh, Like Ryan said, if it's your first time here or if it's your first time in a while, uh, we'd love to meet you. I'll be hanging around after the service, too. Uh, If we haven't met before, I'd love to say hi. But whether it's your first time here, your first time in a while, or you've been coming every day for years, we're just so thankful all of you are here this morning with us. We're about to dismiss, but before we do, we want to sing one final song together. So let's stand and sing Because He Lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died, to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you guys next week.